Hey there, everybody. Uh, welcome back. Um, and I know that this is a phrase that everybody uses when they say, oh, this is a very special edition of this, that, or the other. Well, this actually is a very special edition because um, instead of doing what I normally do, which is to talk about a particular script and um, uh, use that as the basis for uh, certain ideas or insights about writing in general, uh, this time we're going to be much more active or proactive um, because uh, the subject uh, today is the Mongolian script, which you can see right here. Um, and uh, in particular, I'm going to talk about the Endangered Alphabets project and what we are doing and why we're doing it to support the, um, the Mongol people in their efforts to protect and preserve and promote their um, amazing writing system and with it, their language, their culture, their identity. So um, I'm gonna switch over to screen sharing at this point. And it's gonna say, which screen do I wanna share? I wanna share this one right here. And then I go to play from the start. Okay, so um, as uh, pretty much everybody knows, uh, the um, Mongol Empire at one point stretched all the way from Poland to Korea. Over the course of the next centuries, it began to sort of uh, recede. And what we're looking at here is a, a current or contemporary map created by our uh, graphic designer, guru, producer, engineer, Eric Julian, um, of the Mongol lands today. So really, um, there are three areas that are, are um, all in slightly different positions. So at the center of the map, you'll see Mongolia. So Mongolia is an independent nation in its own right. Um, uh, it's the most sparsely populated large country in the world, population of only about three and a half million. Um, and um, from the end of the Second World War onwards, um, it was heavily influenced uh, indeed under the thumb of the Soviet Union. And so consequently, even though in Mongolia, Mongolian is spoken, the alphabet in which it's written is Cyrillic. And this is significant because um, it's a great illustration of what happens when one nation, even a very sizable nation, comes under the thumb of another. Um, the alphabet is part of what is under the thumb. Um, north of Mongolia, you see three areas that are actually part of Russia, um, Altai, Tuva, and Buryatia. Um, then there's another a small Mongolian area way over toward the Caucasus um, called Kalmykia. And these are areas where there are substantial uh, Mongol populations, uh, but the uh, Mongolian language is not universally spoken. Um, the script in which it's written is definitely Cyrillic. And there are individuals there <clears throat> or small groups who are either teaching uh, the Mongol language and culture or are practicing Mongol calligraphy, which we'll come on into a minute, or both. Um, and in Mongolia proper, it's a sign of how important the script is to the Mongolian people that the government has said, right, we're going to stop using the Cyrillic script. Um, and the, the, the timeline for that is um, the next four or five years, um, they're going to start teaching the Mongolian script, which, of course, um, as you know me, um, this, I think, is fantastic news, but it's certainly not easy because almost nobody there knows it or has been practicing it or using it regularly. So there's sort of an endangered alphabets opportunity there. How can we help with the process of restoring their traditional alphabet? But there is a much bigger and more urgent <clears throat> um, endangered alphabet situation in what is called Inner Mongolia or, or Southern Mongolia, which is um, in an autonomous province of China. And the reason for um, our 
current um, project starting up is that uh, a few months ago, the Chinese government announced that schools in Mongolia would, um, as part of a program of bilingual education, start teaching Chinese. And what's more, they would start teaching Chinese in certain really key subjects, ones that have to do with um, Mongol history and identity. And the Mongols, of course, uh, were horrified and appalled by this uh, because um, they, Inner Mongolia has been the oasis, the sanctum of the Mongolian language and script and culture. While the rest of the Mongol lands fell under the thumb of the Russians, this was where that those traditions were, um, were kept safe. And now, um, to say we're going to come in and um, insist that you learn Chinese, um, I simply ask you to ask yourself, what would it be like for you if someone came to you and said, right, from now on, the schools here are all going to teach this different language, this different, different alphabet. And the only people who are saying, what's wrong with Mongolian children learning Chinese, it's a major world language, are people whose language and alphabet are not under threat. Everybody who is in some kind of minority culture understands what this means. It's a form of cultural genocide. And as if to demonstrate what uh, the truth of that, um, a few weeks ago, it was announced um, that um, an exhibition in France, I believe in Rennes, um, uh, was to open, and it was an exhibition about Genghis Khan. And the Chinese government, whom I assume are, are providing partial funding for this exhibition, said, okay, um, this exhibition must not mention the word empire, it must not use the word Mongol, and it must not use the words Genghis Khan. So clearly there is a program that's getting going um, to essentially deny and rob the Mongol people of their identity, their heritage, and their history. Um, and this, as I say, has not been going down well in Inner Mongolia at all. And um, there have been protests, and in fact, um, hundreds of people have been arrested uh, by the uh, authorities for demanding the right to speak and write in their own language. So that, and the next thing you'll, you'll see um, in these pictures is that the, this must be the first ever act of protest whose principal weapon has been calligraphy. So the, 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 the Mongolian script is this extraordinary vertical script which lends itself very well to calligraphy as I'm gonna explain in a minute. And so here we have um, protesters who are holding up um, banners and placards that they have painted themselves. And um, this one is uh, sort of at the heart of um, what we're doing. So uh, this uh, piece of calligraphy says, a foreign language is a tool, our mother tongue is our soul. And that is true um, and so what's happening in um, in Mongolia is absolutely at the heart of everything that the Endangered Alphabets Project is trying to do. And so I decided, right, uh, we are going to get involved. And we're going to get involved in a number of ways. And that's what today's Zoom is really all about, um, is to talk about what we're doing and also to solicit ideas um, that you may have about what we might do. And... Um, and also to talk about our fundraiser, which is just about to start. So uh, the Mongolian script, as you just saw, is this vertical script, and it is inherently calligraphic. So one of the fascinating things about it, and I don't know why this is, and if anybody can tell me why this is, um, I would love to know. Um, the way it evolved, and this is 800 years ago, each letter has three forms, um, an initial form, a medial form, and a final form. And the medial form, in other words, the shape of the letter when it appears in the middle of a word, is really quite simple. 
Um, so if you look um, at the sort of top right corner, you'll see the, um, the vertical word that has kind of a loop in it. Um, so uh, the, the medial forms are, are really um, a, a sort of very functional and, and simple like that. But the initial form, as you'll see, is, has this wonderful kind of swooping attack quality about it, where the, the brush attacks the, um, the, the, the beginning of the word. And then the, the final form of <clears throat> the, um, the, the letter, in other words, the end of every word also has this beautiful flourishes. And so every single word begins with uh, what the French would call élan. Um, and it ends with this, this sort of flourish one way or the other. And so it lends itself absolutely perfectly to uh, calligraphy. And that's one of the first things that the Endangered Alphabets Project is doing. Um, we are creating a gallery of Mongolian calligraphy, which, by the way, is a UNESCO World Heritage in Urgent Need of Safeguarding. Um, and so we're trying to do some safeguarding and promotion here. Um, that should have gone up last night, but we ran into a little technical difficulty. So I'm hoping that's going to go up today. So you'll see um, this gallery of different forms of Mongolian calligraphy. And we are absolutely appealing to other calligraphers to send their work in so we can add to it. And as you can see, um, some of this calligraphy is um, more ornate and more developed. It uses different uh, media. Um, and um, in fact, um, some of it um, uh, actually starts uh, to combine uh, ceramics. So these are all um, the artists, everything of all of these are going to be up on the website. And you can see them and sort of gasp and admire them. I think that is absolutely stunning. So the first thing then we have is this gallery of Mongolian calligraphy. We also have a link there to an essay on why the Mongolian script is so important to the Mongolian people. But um, the next thing we're doing is games. So I need to explain why we're doing games. And um, for this, I need to uh, give credit to Olesz, who's a member of our team. He's in Warsaw. And because he's Polish, and has lived part of his life under Soviet communism. His response when I was talking to him about, you know, what can we do for the, um, the Mongolian people in Inner Mongolia, he said, the best thing you can do is enable them to survive and while surviving to keep their culture in their hearts. And uh, his point was that if we try and do anything involving sort of direct action or protest, then first of all, that might just make the Chinese government that much angrier. But more importantly, they might take it out on the people protesting in Inner Mongolia. And we don't want to make the situation worse. So um, what we decided to do then was to create games that, that first of all, can be played in Mongolia or Inner Mongolia or in Russian Mongolia. And the people playing them are going to use the elements of their own cultural heritage um, and keep it alive in playing the game. And I'll explain what that's all about in a minute. Secondly, is if we can create games that are played elsewhere in the world, in the West, then what that does is it makes it harder to erase the Mongol culture if more and more people are aware of its breadth and its richness and all of its um, astonishing uh, content. So the idea then is to say, right, let's, uh, let's create games that keep a culture alive or that help keep a culture alive. And so we're working on three. Um, the first one, which in some respects is actually the most difficult and challenging, is an alphabet game. And the idea of this is that it would probably be a card game and it would teach the Mongolian alphabet. So this could be used in Mongolia in their um, 
uh, move to reintroduce the Mongolian script in the Mongolian um, heartlands, but it could also be used anywhere else as a fun, unusual, interesting um, word game. So um, we have a small team working on the alphabet game. The second game is almost um, unbearably cute. Um, so I started thinking we want to have a game for younger kids. Um, ideally, we want to have games that really um, introduce or reinforce the Mongolian culture, language, and script at all levels, at, at, at all ages, and all levels of um, ability. And so in England, there is a game, a common game called Happy Families. And it's played by young kids and their parents. And it's a special deck. It's actually a bit like the American game Go Fish. It's, it's a special deck. And the deck consists of, let's say, eight different professions. Let's say butcher, baker, candlestick maker, banker, um, hardware store owner, who knows what, right? And each of those um, professions has four cards. Um, so it could be um, Mr. Plumber, Mrs. Plumber, Master Plumber, Miss Plumber. Um, there are also versions with animals. So it could be Mr. Fox, Mrs. Fox, Master Fox, Fox Miss Fox. And um, I thought Mongolia is renowned for being a, um, a, a finding place for dinosaur fossils. And so we're creating a version of happy families with happy dinosaur families, all dinosaurs found in Mongolia, which by the way, includes the Velociraptor. So we're gonna have adult male, adult female, juvenile hatchling. And so what happens is that you get dealt some cards and you go around, do you have um, adult male Velociraptor? <clears throat> and the person says yes or no, and gives you the card and you're trying to collect the family. Um, and of course, on the cards, we'll have the image, we'll have the name of the dinosaur, we'll also have the name of the dinosaur in Mongolian and in the Mongolian script. At that age, just for them to know that Mongolia exists, and it's a place that is absolutely rich with this um, extraordinary historical heritage or prehistorical heritage, that may be all we can achieve. But having this other material on it as well, parents can talk to kids about it. <clears throat> it's another way of um, opening the door to that kind of panorama that is the vast panorama that is Mongolia. But the third game is the one that is the subject of our Kickstarter campaign, which I hope is gonna launch today. And so what you see on the screen here are these unbelievable cards um, that have been designed by uh, two different artists, one in Poland, um, one in California, who is um, a, a Mongolian artist who practices the art of paper cutting. Um, they have very different styles. Um, and then the whole thing has been designed and created once again by the ever-present and ever-reliable Alec Julian. Um, <clears throat> so let me tell you a little about how, how this game works because this is the game that is the subject of our Kickstarter. This is the game that I hope you're gonna support and tell everybody you know about and say, isn't it cool? And check out that amazing artwork as well. Okay, so this is how the game works. So the backstory is that when the beginning of the 1200s, Chinggis Khan um, establishes this enormous empire, he and his um, family, his descendants, faced a really interesting what? What kind of an empire do we want? If we are powerful, if we can control all of this, what do we want to do with this? Do we want to have sort of a European style city-based um, culture? Or do we want to stay true to our roots and have a nomadic grassland desert-based culture? And that was a very real debate. And in a way, it still is. It's, in, it's, the, it's a debate that's um, 
that really is about like, what is the identity of the Mongol people? Uh, what is, uh, where is the Mongol, Mongol soul now and in the future? And so we thought, wouldn't it be cool if we set the game up this way? So there are half a dozen cards that represent Mongolian gods. And each has their own view of where Mongolia should go. And um, it plays out kind of like in Greek mythology, the gods are always arguing and fighting with each other, but instead of actually hitting each other, you know, like, you know, Thor and Captain, Captain America, um, they play their squabbles out on the human chessboard. And so what we're gonna do is that each player becomes the representative of a god who is trying to establish a particular future for Mongolia. Is it going to be a military empire? Is it going to be a spiritual empire? Because Mongolia is an extraordinarily spiritual place. Is it going to be a trade-based empire? Is it going to be an empire of learning? So um, players then <clears throat> choose a champion, um, somebody from um, Mongolian history or, for, uh, or mythology. We've got these cards, these characters, and those characters, those champions are then going to work through the game to try and create one particular version of the Mongolia of the future. So the way they do this is by collecting various assets. And so different, um, different champions need different assets. So if you're trying to establish a military empire, then clearly you want the horse, you want the bow and arrow, you know, these cards. If you're trying to establish a spiritual empire, then you want the, the stupa um, or, or um, um, sort of a can based sacred place. Um, frankly, everybody wants the horse. So um, you're, you're trying to collect those cards. And you're also traveling around the Mongol lands. So here comes the, one of the really cool things. The game is not gonna come in a box with a board. It's gonna come in a bag because this is a game for a nomadic people, right? So it comes in a bag and the bag opens up and becomes the game mat. And also instead of rolling dice, you roll shagai. So shagai are sheep's ankle bones, which are used in Mongolia and actually throughout Central Asia um, as uh, for children's games like marbles or jacks, but also for divination. And so we're going to use them for, for divination in the game. They will determine the moves and the outcome and the success or lack of success uh, of the characters. So the characters travel around trying to collect these assets that will help them establish their version of Mongolia of the future. And in the process, they're coming up against threats. So um, the threats could be the other players. They could be the Mongolian death worm. They could be the Mangus, which is the many headed monster of um, Mongolian mythology. And um, so you're, you're fighting off these threats and you're trying to collect these assets and everything leads to Nardom. Now, Nardom, and this is absolutely true, is the annual festival of the Mongols. It's like the like their biggest state fair plus their Olympics. It involves storytelling. It involves um, traditional sports. It involves performance. All these things. So everything comes together at Nardom, and there is trading, and then there is fighting and contests. And the player who has done the best job of collecting the assets necessary to um, establish their version of Mongolia is the winner. But one of the characters, and you don't know who, is Lobsagoy, who is the trickster demon, whose aim is simply to mess with everybody else so that nobody establishes their version of, of the Mongolia chaos. So that's our game. And to give you, there is our, our lobster guy. So as you can see, this is this phenomenal um, artwork uh, we've been lucky enough to get from our Mongolian artist. 
And this is, uh, as I say, this is paper cut artwork. Um, and um, uh, the uh, basic game mechanics, the basic plot, the basic look of it are all designed. And then we're gonna work on um, fine tuning it over the course of probably the next three or four months. But this is why we need your support. Um, uh, obviously I'm gonna pay the artists, um, I'm gonna pay Alec, um, and we, uh, we're trying to raise $20,000. Um, that's, if you know anything about creating games, that's a very small sum of money, but obviously it's also a very large sum of money. Um, and um, as I say, our Kickstarter campaign should go live today. And um, in the email that I send out to everybody who registered for today's talk, um, I'm going to put the link to the Kickstarter and the high hope that you'll support us and you will um, circulate the link to people you know. Um, and uh, as always with our Kickstarters, there are all kinds of very, very cool and unusual and frankly, totally unique rewards. Um, and um, so to come full circle, uh, this is our poster, which is, by the way, one of the rewards for the uh, Kickstarter. So this is my carving, which you've seen behind me here. Um, and this is the slogan, a foreign language is a tool. Our mother tongue is our soul. Um, and as I've said, this really speaks to how deeply um, the language and the script um, matter to the Mongol people um, and to everybody with an endangered alphabet. Um, so this is something that I really hope that um, you know, you'll take to heart and you'll take away. Uh, once again, poster created by Alec who does absolutely everything. So um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop um, screen sharing now and um, throw it open to a particular kind of um, Q&A. So um, I would love to hear your questions about the Mongolian script, although I, I may not be able to answer all of them. <clears throat> I would also like to hear your thoughts about our um, campaign. If you have ideas for particular rewards, that'd be great. If you have suggestions for other games or other ways in which we can help, um, then uh, please um, put them in the chat function. That's the best way of making sure that um, we see them and they don't get lost. Um, and um, so without any further ado, or I don't for that matter, um, I'm going to throw this open to you and for discussion in general. And Alec is going to be our moderator as always. Um, so we'll be in touch with you after this, this talk is over. And I'd, I'd love to pull you in on the team that's working on these things. Great. Um, Alec, have we got any others? Yeah, a couple of interesting questions. Um... Ashley says, most Mongolians I've met are either Buddhist or shamanists. Where are these gods being pulled from? Ah, so one of the things that, one of the things that I keep thinking is expansion packs. Um, so if this were actually a trading card game, um, the Mon Mongolian culture is so rich that there could be all kinds of, of, of expansion packs. So um, you could have a whole series of Buddhist deities, for example, and, and demigods as an expansion pack. Um, we're using um, uh, uh, traditional um, deities, um, but then in particular areas, um, like in Buryatia, for example, they have you know, their own subset of um, so um, we are actually, especially in this first iteration, we are deliberately pulling in characters from both history and mythology, and we're pulling in, in characters from different areas within the Mongol lands, because, um, you know, one of the things that anybody tries to do who wants to suppress a people is, is divide and conquer them and, and insist on the fact that they are marginal um, and, uh, and of no significance. Um, and um, so we are, uh, we're gonna have monsters from all over um, 
and, uh, and, and gods from all over, and um, then a wide variety of assets and heroes. So some of the heroes or champions that um, uh, the player moves around the board are, um, are, are real people or were real people like Genghis Khan, like Zanabazar, um, you know, this, this great figure uh, in uh, Mongolian history and language and learning. Um, but some of them are, are, are sort of from uh, Mongolian um, epic um, poems or, or tales. Um, so we're sort of pulling all of those in. And, and if the game is popular enough, then as I say, expansion packs, we'll bring in um, more people or more figures from early shamanism um, or uh, more people, uh, more figures from uh, the, the sort of the, the, the Tibetan influence Buddhist um, arena. Um, and as I say, I'm, I'm, I'm open to suggestions. Uh, all, of, all of the information we have so far has been sent to us either by our uh, Mongolian collaborators or from people who have been in Mongolia, who've worked in Mongolia, who teach like Mongolian studies. So we're hoping we get it right, but we're always open to, uh, you know, more suggestions and corrections. Well, that answers one of the next questions. Do you oh. have a Mongolian counterpart providing input on the game? Oh, absolutely. Yep. Yep. Uh, and and then Katie asks, what about the unintended consequences of Mongolians in Inner Mongolia being found with the game? Has that been considered? Believe me, that has actually occurred to me. And that's one of the reasons why the game is going to be in a bag so that everything can be scooped up and, and moved on. Um, this was an idea that actually came to us um, in a previous project we did when we were working with indigenous people in uh, the Chittagong Hill Tracks of Bangladesh, um, where we were starting to create a, a board game there. And there, the military presence and the threat of reprisal is, is a serious one. Um, and um, so uh being able to create something that is easily hidden or easily disposed of um, was actually part of our thinking um obviously as i said before um uh you know rule number one first do no harm um uh we're not even attempting to get this game produced in in a mongolia but um you know, if we produce it in Mongolia and if copies make their way across the border, then that's that's their choice. Um, uh, and then we have to um, we have to hope it's it's a choice that uh, is not held against them. Oh, there's a comment about the Goethe Institute. What's that? Have tools for language learning. I'm okay. Helpful. Let's check out. Anybody else have a question? That's interesting because um, uh, that's great. Um, because I'm assuming the Goethe Institute is in Germany. Actually, our principal um, collaborator on the alphabet game is also German. Um, so um, I will put him in touch with the Goethe Institute. Um, at the moment, so um, yes, you talk about language learning game apps. At the moment, my aim is to create games that can be played where there is no reliable internet signal and preferably even where there's no electricity. Um, because obviously the country of Mongolia, um, much of it is, uh, as I say, it's the, it's the most sparsely populated major country in the world. So I think we have to assume that the game itself is nomadic. The game can travel and can be used anywhere or the games. Um, not to mention the fact that game apps are, <laughs> if you think it's expensive creating a game, try creating an electronic game. In a minimum of two years and a whole team of people. So if if we're able to find partners who want to work with that on us, uh, work with us on that, that'd be great. Um, I'm trying to start really kind of practical and bare bones. And actually, the phrase bare bones when you're talking about Shigai is actually very appropriate. This is a game that literally is played with bare bones. There's a suggestion also for luminescent ink, which is pretty funny. <laughs> 
I love it. That's a great idea. It's probably more expensive to print, but that's a wonderful idea. <laughs> okay, anything else? All right, well, in that case, um, uh, I hereby declare this, um, this Zoom over. As I say, everybody who's registered for this is um, going to get a follow-up email with a link to um, the recording, because this has all been uh, recorded. Um, the recording is going to go up on YouTube sometime in the next 24 hours. Um, and uh, we are hoping and assuming that the Kick that Kickstarter is going to approve our campaign, in which case we'll also give you that link. And um, please, please not only support us, but share it with everybody you know. Okay, so the next talk on Sunday is going to be the last one in this series. Uh, it's going to be on the indigenous scripts of the Philippines, especially by Bayan. Um, and uh, as far as I know, by Bayan and uh, some of the other indigenous scripts of the Philippines are the only ones in the world where there is actually um, a bill before the uh, Philippine Congress to protect, preserve, and promote traditional writing systems um, with all kinds of um, spelling out as to what that actually involves and funding and all that kind of stuff. Whether that happens, of course, remains to be seen, but um, that suggests one way ahead for um, traditional cultures who have their own writing system and are struggling to gain the kind of identity and respect that comes with it. So that'll be on Sunday. Hope to see you all then. In the meantime, I will pass us back over to our theme music, which was uh, composed by Patricia Julian, not no relative of Alec. Thank you.